describe it clearly, we should be. And you know, um, we had people at last night, so potentially someone or someone during that later. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay, so uh, we have Dan Guido from NYU Poly to uh, come and discuss ninjas. Uh, <laughs> I met Dan uh, last last fall uh, in New York at the OWASP AppSec uh, conference, and he told me about this this uh, pen test course he was putting together, uh, creating, designing, delivering um, at, at NYU Poly, and uh, I found it really interesting because, as far as I know, none of the major universities are doing anything quite like this. You have a lot of universities that have, um, you know computer security courses, but they're more like survey courses and not really tuned to this pen testing um, as this one is. So uh, a couple months ago, uh, we reached out and said, hey, come to source. Um, tell us what you did. Tell us what you learned, what went wrong, what went right, um, so that hopefully other people can learn from the experience and, uh, uh, and do this at, at other uh, academic institutions as well. So with that, uh, Dan Guido. Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> All right. So uh, this talk is, so you want to train an army of ninjas. A <laughs> uh, little, little bit about myself. Uh, for the last five years, I've kind of defined myself as being a security researcher at the ISIS lab in uh, NYU Poly. And right now I'm doing incident response for somebody really big in New York City. Uh, I graduated this semester. Uh, I, I define my sort of original entry point into the world of security as a capture the flag competition that I played in in 2004. Uh, our university actually has something called Cybersecurity Awareness Week, where a bunch of people from our lab get together and we put together um, contests for cash prizes uh, and we open it up to local university students, uh, New York City metro area university students, and uh, this year we went international. We had people come in from Australia, Europe, and, and so on. But that's what dragged me in, uh, and it was really good. So part of the reason why I'm doing this and part of the reason why I agreed to teach this or why I wanted to teach this course is because uh, I, I feel like I have a lot of experience being a student and um, a lot of things sort of got on my nerves while I was going through school and there were things that I thought I could, I could fix, I could make better. Uh, so I felt like I had a unique perspective that I, that I brought to all this and that's why I wanted to teach this course. So a little bit about NYU Poly. So Chris got into it a little bit. NYU Poly is not uh, your average university when it comes to information security. We had an InfoSec program in the early 2000s. I think it started in 2001. Um, we got it uh, funded by a bunch of different government grants. Uh, we're certified as an NSA Center of Excellence in Education and Research. Uh, so pretty much everybody has the education certification now, but very few people have the research certification. And what's involved in that is you have to um, have students working in certain areas, you have to teach certain courses, it's, it's fairly rigorous from what I understand. Um, we also offer uh, certifications in information security, uh, these NSTI, SSI, which I'm sure you've never heard of, but uh, they're government specific and they prescribe certain things uh, that you have to know for information security. And we also have about 10 different courses in InfoSec. We have application security, biometrics, uh, computer network security, uh, we have the pen test class, so Anything? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Good? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so, so, right. So, NYU Poly, the party's already started. We have uh, a lot of these courses already. So, why am I talking to you? Uh, I'm talking to you because the Pentest course kind of suffered from a little bit of neglect. Um, some people thought it up, or we had to make it probably. Uh, in response to one of those certifications that we got. And it was great when it started, but it got passed around between various hands uh, from semester to semester, and it sort of declined in quality over time. Until when I took it in 2006, uh, it was kind of at what I feel its lowest point. Um, me and another student actually got so uh, fed up with it that mid-semester we had a coup and took, took it over. <laughs> um, and him and I came in with lesson plans and projects for the rest of the semester. So I uh, asked my professor to take it over uh, in July 2008, but we'll get to that. Right, so <laughs> the class turned out awesome. 
uh, it was it was a fantastic class. I was extremely happy with uh, all the student work, and the students were really happy with me. And what I want to do in this talk is explain to you uh, why I think we did a great job, and how you guys can do just as well. But um, it wasn't all just me. The star down there is because it wasn't so much me as it was the other people who were helping me. So who helped me? Uh, some of these guys you might recognize. Uh, Steven Ridley is a reverse engineer that works at Montesano. Uh, I met him at a bar. <laughs> I met most of these people at CitySec, at New York Sec. Uh, Dean DeBeer from Zero Day Solutions. Uh, Mike Zuzman from Intrepidus Group. He's uh, in this shot. He's demoing his company's uh, tool that they offer, uh, FishMe, a <laughs> uh, phishing software as a service. Um, service. Dino, who's going to be speaking in this room after me, and Eric Betas, who's giving a talk later this week, and I, I highly encourage you to go see or talk to any of these people if you can find them here today. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> okay. So why are you here listening to me? So you're here listening to me because I took this course over, and the students turned out awesome work. I got them to uh, understand vulnerability analysis and penetration testing well enough that they were able to find zero-day vulnerabilities in Shoutcast and a uh, QNAP network attached storage drive. Uh, they were able to write immunity debugger scripts for uh, buffer tracking. Uh, they contributed code to Metasploit, which uh, hasn't been made public yet, and I'm going to be releasing all this stuff today. But um, I, I really couldn't be happier with the quality of work that went on in this class. I, I thought it was absolutely fantastic. Uh, from the opposite angle, the students loved the class. Um, these are some of the comments that I got on the feedback form at the end of the class. I think the two best ones are the two bottom ones. The only course that's given me my value for my money, and it's been 13 semesters undergrad and grad, this is simply the best. So the students love the course. So two reasons why you should listen to me. And the third reason is because the class held the students. They they became passionate about the material so much that they continued doing it after the class was over. And this is really hard to do in a university sometimes. You know, you take classes, they end, you start a whole bunch of new ones, you don't have any time. But these students were so passionate about it that uh, I see them at New York Sec every month, I see them at conferences, uh, a whole bunch of them are working on independent research projects now. And one student actually quit his job and went to go uh, work at an independent consultant. Um, so. They also had, uh, so the students in the class at the time spread the word about the course to everybody else in the university. And there was a huge amount of interest for a second run course. I thought I was going to have about 50 people if I taught the course this semester. So the, the class bred passionate students. Okay, so now what am I going to go over today? So how am I going to explain all this to you? Um, first, I'm going to go over some of the uh, tips, tricks, sort of design patterns, what I called it in the abstract, about uh, how you could teach the course successfully. Um, this isn't re anything revolutionary. Uh, a lot of it's um, general stuff that's just if you're a teacher, you really should know. Some of it's more specific to me uh, and, and to the class. And then uh, after I explain those tips and tricks, we're going to go into the actual class, how I ran it, what we did, uh, how I graded it, and, and that sort of stuff, the day-to-day operations of the class. Okay. So rules for the teacher. Does anybody know who this is, just by the way? Dr. Yes. All right. I owe you a beer tonight. <laughs> okay. That is Dr. McNinja, one of my favorite web comics. All right. Uh, <clears throat> so rules for, the, rules for the teacher, rules for the sensei. Uh, stay current and know where to look for help. This is pretty obvious, right? Uh, if, if you're going to be teaching a class, you need to know what's out there and you need to be able to provide direction to the people uh, that are in your class, especially in a pen test class because if you don't do this, the only thing anybody's going to be concerned with is like cracking web and, you know, uh, breaking password hashes and running John. You need to give them some kind of direction. You need to know what's out there. Uh, so my advice to you is if you're teaching one of these courses, maintain a presence in your community. Go to conferences, read Daily Dave, read some blogs. Um, lots of academics don't really remember this, and I feel like they, uh, they separate themselves from the rest of the people here. And I'm probably preaching to the choir, but it needs to be said. 
Uh, right, so the rule to remember is you don't have to know everything. You don't have to be a, a Dino Daisovi, um, but <laughs> you, you have to know where you can go to find the answer. Okay, so in my case, uh, action was the largest roadblock to getting this implemented. Um, I uh, volunteered for it, and I got it. <laughs> Uh, the reason why the course kind of was on that downward slide for so long is because it's really hard to make a course. Um, you know, people uh, underestimate how much work goes into this and, um, you know, you have to grade, you have to come up with tests and you have to answer questions during the week and it, it's a lot more than just showing up. Um, so, you know, once I finally got the initiative, I said, I have the free time, I'm going to go do it, let me do it. My professor gave it to me, and that's, that's all that was really necessary. Um, so like I said, creating a course from scratch is hard, and I, I mean, I just told you that, and I just told you to go for it, so that those seem kind of contradictory, but I'm going to help you with this, because at the end of this lecture, there's a link over there, which 404 is right now, but it'll be up in about an hour, <laughs> uh, where I'm going to post as much course material from my course online as I can and all of you will be able to sort of ride on, uh, on my course if you want to make one that's just like it. <clears throat> so one thing that I, I haven't heard a whole lot about, I know there are some students over here, where um, the university doesn't have an InfoSec program and they're resistant to implementing one, or they're resistant to implementing uh, an offensive security course like a penetration testing course. Um, some strategies that I think might be useful if uh, you, you haven't been able to do this yet, are to speak to them in terms of what they understand, which is money. Uh, <laughs> the NSA Center of Excellence can open up, uh, the NSA Center of Excellence uh, certification can open up lots of funding dollars for you. You can get grants for lots of information security research from the National Science Foundation, and uh, it can really elevate the standing of your computer science, computer engineering, whatever department, uh, if you do this stuff. So that's probably the route I would take, but like I said, I didn't have to do this. We've had a program for a long time, and uh, my department was very receptive to, to this type of course. Okay, rules for the classroom. So I highly suggest that you videotape your lectures. Uh, not everyone can see what you're doing when you're, when you're you know, running through shell code or you're dumping uh, like disassembly to the screen. So. Um, videotape your lectures and offer it up to your students. Uh, the ones that are taking your course that semester. So w we had a problem. We videotaped our lectures and I didn't even get the videotapes until about uh, two weeks ago. <laughs> so make sure you do it in real time because it's extremely valuable for a student to be able to go back and sort of TiVo and fast forward and rewind the lecture as they're trying to do the homework. Um, and it's not that, that hard to do. You know, you need a camera, you can hire a student, and edit the whole thing in iMovie, and it turns out okay. Uh, obviously, you know, the way to do it is to hire one of these guys in the back and get them to make a professional video out of it, but you don't have to go that far. Now, once you have those, those videos, someone's definitely going to say, well, why can't we take those videos and turn them into an online course? Throw them up somewhere, put up the same assignments, do the whole thing online. Uh, problem is that the people that say that don't understand really the difference between uh, an in-class course and an online course. There's lots of things that differ, even though people are looking at the same videos, doing the same assignments, and uh, those differences can be a killer. Uh, one such difference is that you're not able to communicate with students in real time, and if you answer one student, other students might not be able to uh, hear your answer. And there's various ways to you know, sort of fudge this, but none of them are perfect. None of them are better than teaching a course in class. Another thing is that it's hard to create passionate students. There's a lack of what I call emotional buy-in. Um, when you're taking a course online, you're probably browsing the web and you're Twittering and like probably some of you guys are in here right now. But it's sort of, it, it, it's, it's not real. Uh, you don't get connected to it as well. You don't pay attention. And that destroys a lot of what I felt was great about our course. So the bottom line is that if you want the flexibility of an online course where you know, maybe somebody that works from 9 to 5 can't show up at noon on a Friday to take your course, teach a night class instead. Start it at 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock and uh, let anybody show up. Okay.
So books. So if you were following the previous advice, then you're reading blogs, you're going to conferences, you're reading mailing lists, then you should know where all the best resources are and you should know that they're all online and they're all free and they're all much more current than any books that you can find. Um, another problem is that if you want to pick out a book to teach a course like we did, um, there's no one book that covers everything we did in our class. And I'll go into this later, but we taught a very broad array of topics. And even a book that's like 400 pages now, uh, Hacking the Art of Exploitation, doesn't cover everything we did. So if you have to pick one, pick this one, because it's huge, <laughs> covers a lot of material, it has a very uh, easy introduction into things like C programming, um, and as a bonus, it kind of is so large that it looks like a textbook now. <laughs> um, if you have to pick a second one, I actually recommend a non-technical, uh, non-reference material, non-technical book. Something like Confessions of Teenage Hackers is probably more useful than a book full of reference material. It is more important to get inspired students than it is to have a book of reference material. Okay, equipment. So, depending on how you want to teach the course, um, you may or may not need equipment. For us, we, uh, we taught a very application security centric course. We taught something that focused on uh, applications that students had on their computers, operating systems, stuff that we could virtualize inside of VMware Player. And that let us keep everything really cheap uh, and very lightweight. If you want to teach a network pen test course, you obviously need to go get uh, routers and switches and other gear. But if you took the route that we did, you won't need any of this. Um, so what about targets? If you're not going to buy anything, what are you going to hack? Uh, your students have applications on their computers that are vulnerable to everything you're going to teach them. And there's no reason why they can't go after those. Uh, they have devices. The, some of the projects that my students did were all um, consumer electronic devices they had in their dorm room that they wanted to break into or something that their roommate had. Uh, if you're doing reverse engineering, there's offensive computing, which is a, a giant malware database. Uh, that you can go download um, any current malware from and reverse it, or uh, just get any Windows binary out there. Everything works. Um, exploitation, there's an old software library called Secure Infos, I'm pretty sure. Uh, it's run by Jerome, Jerome Atheist, the guy who does FR hack. Uh, or you could write your own, and that's pretty easy. Uh, you know, a page of C code is usually enough to teach a student how to write an exploit. Uh, web applications are the most difficult. Normally when you're doing a web application assessment, you're doing a black box for something you can't get the source code to. But if you want to simulate that, you know, what are you going to get? You're going to get something that's open source and you're going to put it up somewhere and maybe change the code a bit to inject some vulnerabilities. But uh, it's not quite the same. So if you want to do web apps, what I would suggest is investing a little bit into a, into a simple one. And I'm going to help with this also. Uh, we had our students do an assignment where they had to actually make the vulnerable application and then break into it a week later. So I'll release a few of their projects. <laughs> All right, a mailing list. So this was extremely important and I felt like I was uh, tricking my students when I set this up and, and started using it. Students today, uh, you know, they, they read 10 pages of Twitter and they answer 50 emails and they read like 100 blog entries every day. This stuff sort of just comes naturally and they don't, they don't consider it work. It's just what they do in their, their dead time. So if you set up a mailing list and subscribe everybody to it, you can continue the class after you meet, you know, uh, forever. And you can send them emails and they'll read them. And it's a way to get them more fully immersed in the topic and continue discussions that you started inside class, outside class. Uh, it's also great for getting students who are a bit more quiet in class to speak up. And it's also helpful because if students have questions, you're not the only one that has to answer them. Other students can answer their own questions. Uh, so it actually ends up being less work for you. Um, one thing that we did use the mailing list for was before the class even started, we gauged the skill level of everybody in it by uh, posting a question to the mailing list that sort of analyzed their, what their mindset was, their, their attacker's mindset. We asked them if they weren't registered for the course, how would they gain access to the course material? And we tried to encourage them to come up with different ways to, uh, to gain access to the various systems that held uh, the course material or the, the people that would be distributing it. And that was valuable for us because it gave us a good starting point uh, for the first lecture. 
we could we could already adjust uh, by the first lecture before it started to uh, how we thought the students were uh, capable of, of learning this stuff. Okay, tactics. <laughs> so uh, Dino convinced me to add the own some shit in there. Uh, Inspire your students. This really, I mean, it doesn't need to be said, but it does. Um, I, I think the most telling point on here is the one minute of excitement is worth one hour of grade threats. If you can uh, excite your students at the beginning of the lecture, they're, they're yours for the rest of that two hours. Um, they will pay attention. They will ask questions. They'll go home that night, and they'll, they'll start doing their homework instead of waiting till you know, the night before a week later. Um, you don't want to have your lectures arranged in such a way where you're just putting formulas up on the board, and I, I know that's not specific to the pen test class, but the, the metaphor is still the same. You don't want to put up formulas for formula's sake. You want to tie it back to a practical skill. Uh, so we always try to, to show um, demos or uh, you know, some way that they would be able to use this in real life. Um, yeah, excitement gets better quality work. This is more of an effect than a cause. Uh, if you were following some of the advice that I gave earlier in the lecture, then a lot of this will come naturally. Uh, so the first point there, create an aura of mysticism around yourself and be the uber hacksaw your students hope to become. Uh, that's definitely an effect. Um, I didn't want that to happen because I'm not any kind of you know uber hacksaw or anything. I, I, there's a lot of stuff that I'm that I'm weak on, and I was a, a student in this course as much as I was a, as a professor, but. Um, a couple of weeks in, the students started referring to me as like this person that could break into anything and uh, going around telling their friends about this awesome course and this professor who's like some super hacker. And it was kind of cute, but <laughs> so it's more of an effect. Um, if you're doing everything right, this will happen. The feedback slide, have a mole. Uh, I have never taught a class before and I didn't know how well I was gonna do. Uh, I didn't know if everything that we put together was going to work well, and I didn't know if students were going to understand it. You know, I've been doing security for a long time, and a lot of the people in the course had never done anything having to do with security. They were your standard CS and CE majors. So what I did was I made sure I met with a student uh, at about the midpoint in the week, and I made sure that he understood the lecture, I made sure that he understood the homework, and I made sure that we were going over topics that he wanted to hear because really the course is all about them. Um, so that feedback was extremely valuable because then, uh, as before, I could tell the professor or whoever was teaching that class, whether it was me or someone else, uh, before they even got in the room, uh, what the students were expecting, what skill level, level they were at, whether they understood their lecture from the previous week, and that was extremely valuable. Um, and then on, on the flip side, get formal feedback at the end. Uh, it's useful for the people teaching the course because, you know, I, like I expect all of you guys to, to tell me what I did wrong because I need to be a better speaker and I, I want to improve and so does everybody else that, that, uh, that does this kind of thing. Um, and getting that feedback at the end of the course is the best way to do that. Uh, that feedback is also extremely valuable to show your department that you provided value to their curriculum. So I have like a big packet full of, uh, full of responses that all say that this is the best course ever and that you know here's X, Y, and Z reasons why. And I can take that and show it to my professor or the department head and say, you know, give me a raise. <laughs> and it, it, it's, it's good for leverage. Um, now what's odd is that these, these uh, feedback forms are actually very difficult to create. I made two of them, I, or I had to make two of them. Um, the first one that I made, my students filled it out as if it were a popularity contest, and I didn't get any actionable feedback. Um, I modified two words in the, in the template, and then I got everything that I was looking for. So um, I'll show you the template that I used on, uh, on the website at the end, and hopefully uh, that will help you guys. Okay, strategies. So don't put all the content together yourself. So uh, as I said in one of the first slides, you know, you're not going to know everything. You can't know everything. Um, and also nobody else can know everything. So my point here is Chris Eagle, if anybody knows him, he's an instructor from the Naval Postgraduate School, wrote the, uh, the Ida Pro book. He's an amazing reverse engineer, but you don't see him teaching web hacking. 
So there are certain things that if you don't know anything about, you know, don't even try. It's, it's okay. Uh, you can admit that there are, stuff, there are things that you don't know. But what happens when you come to a topic like that and you don't quite know what's going on is that you really should steal from people that are smarter than you and not be ashamed of that. There's plenty of, of material on the web that you can go and grab and use for your own course. And I did this and you should do this and you can steal from me this time. <laughs> uh, the first bullet point, or ask anyone else to, what that refers to is that for a long time, um, instead of doing this course in-house, some, uh, some of my professors were trying to find an outside person uh, to do it. And somebody would come in and do a guest lecture for an hour. They would talk about some research project they were doing that attracted some interest for us to invite them. And we would you know, corner them in a room and say, we think you're really great. Why don't you teach a 12-week course and grade it for 30 students? And they would freak out and run out of the room. So <laughs> that idea, just do it yourself. It, it, it's fine. All right. So, right. So be resourceful. All right, skip the basics and jump right in. So this is another more of an effect than a cause. If you have inspired students and you have people that really want to want to learn this and you've been doing everything right, then then anybody is going to be able to do anything that you throw at them. We had students uh, write their first exploits. They'd never heard of exploits before, never understood how they worked, but we got them to write exploits in about two hours. Uh, we got them to um, understand IDA and learn x86 assembly in a period of about a week. Um, these things are all possible, and it's, it's not that difficult as long as you're, uh, you're engaging them well. Um, so one thing that helped with that is I introduced all the topics early. So on that mailing list, I made sure to introduce, like, fuzzing. Most CS, per, uh, CS students have never heard of fuzzing, and that's really sad, and they really should, but they haven't, so you've got to introduce them to the topic. So a week before uh, Mike Zussman came in, who did the fuzzing lectures, um, I sent them out a PDF that just described what fuzzing was, and I think it was a news article from somewhere. But that was enough so that when Mike came in, he could hit the ground running and he could talk only about the things that, uh, only about the technical topics that um, he, he wanted to. All right, so keep them inspired, they will surprise you. So <laughs> one of the surprises I got was for the exploit uh, section when students wrote their first exploit. We had one guy come in and he wrote what I'm gonna call a ghetto exploit. He made a he made a Perl script that would actually let you choose different payloads to send out, um, and he diffed the uh, the shell code the the like hex shell code not the not the assembly to figure out exactly what bytes changed every time you changed the uh, the port number, and then he would patch those addresses those port numbers in and then send out the payload in this little Perl script and it was like <laughs> I would never think of doing that because I know Metasploit exists, but uh, it was it was really impressive. So he, he was also very happy when we showed him Metasploit that day. <laughs> Saved him a lot of work. Okay, make your students present. So I think that a hacker who can't communicate is useless. That might be my opinion, but uh, it's what I think. Um, if you can't explain what you found and what problems that you found uh, to the person who's going to end up fixing them, then you're not of very much value. So. In this course, I put uh, a large priority on making sure that students could communicate their findings to me and to the other students in the class. So uh, at the end for their final projects, everybody had to do a presentation. Nobody could get out of it, even though many people asked. <laughs> and the, uh, the make your students famous part, I think actually the better point to describe it is encourage your students to work on homework and projects that are practical and that they can release. So instead of having all of our students do problem sets, uh, we actually tried to come up with assignments that would let them use real tools and contribute to them in a, in a way that um, other people would benefit. So, for instance, for our post-exploitation class, we had them all write meterpreter scripts, and we had them write scripts for things that didn't exist yet. Uh, and I'm going to release a few of those today, too. Um, now, what happens when a student gets that is they try harder. They know that everybody's going to see their code when, when it's done. Um, they try and come up with better solutions because they know other people are going to use it. And they get exposure to what's actually out there. I'm absolutely sure that it was more beneficial to use Metasploit and use Meterpreter uh, and write these Ruby scripts than any sort of isolated problem we could have given them. <laughs> All right. What do you think? What game? <laughs> Say what? 
No, close. Uh, this is this is what is this? Bad dudes versus Ninja Dragon or something like that. It's a Nintendo game from like 1988. But yeah, the president has been kidnapped by ninjas. Are you a bad enough dude to rescue the president? So luckily, we didn't have any like really bad dudes in the class. They didn't do anything really stupid. Um, but you know, I did have to go over things like ethics at least a little bit. Um, I really didn't want to get caught up in this. It's it's a technical course. It's not a course in philosophy or law. And um, actually, when I took the course in 2006, we had some kid, and I don't know why, but every single lecture, he would debate and argue about the morals and the ethics of what we were teaching. And it slowed down the class, and I didn't want to repeat that. So the very first lecture, the first like 10 minutes, I defined what the difference between hacking and pen testing was, and I made sure all the students understood the difference. And for all of you guys, the difference is permission, <laughs> if you were unclear. Um, <laughs> I spent about 30 minutes defining the disclosure debate. I put it in perspective for them. So I defined, or I told them where it came from and how it evolved. And you know, I didn't just define that, oh, this is no disclosure, this is full disclosure, this is responsible disclosure. I kind of gave them the history behind it. And uh, that turned out to be really important. A lot of students said that that, that gave them uh, the perspective they needed to make sort of educated decisions about all this. And then, uh, Luckily, right in the middle of the semester, some student from, I think, Vancouver got arrested for hacking into his university. So it, it was a really good uh, current event to send out on the mailing list to sort of remind them six weeks in about what they should and they shouldn't do. Uh, so one funny thing that happened when uh, we taught them reverse engineering is, you know, we're trying to make all the lectures practical. We're trying to teach them things that uh, we think would excite them and would teach them skills that they want to know. Uh, we talked about copy protection, you know. It's an important topic if you're talking about reverse engineering. So we told them how to patch software. <laughs> so the next week, this kid comes in and he's like, yeah, I had this course and we had to use the simulator and it runs like 100 times slower if you don't patch it. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute, what? You patched it? He's like, yeah, I patched the software so it runs 100 times faster and then I could do all my homework for the whole course in like one night. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I told him, you know, don't release that on the internet and like, you know, you shouldn't, that should be for educational purposes only, but uh, your students will kind of do these funny things. You, um, so you do need to have this discussion. Um, some other courses, uh, I know, I think CMU has a course that does like the fundamentals of hacking. I, I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm correct or not, but they actually make their students, or I don't know if this is true, but what I heard is that they make their students sign a form at the beginning of the class to uh, pledge or you know, affirm that they, that they won't do evil things. Um, I think that goes a bit too far. I don't know if you have to do that. Uh, I didn't do that, and this was enough. But if anybody has any opinions about it, you know, tell me, tell me after the lecture, after the talk. OK, the class. This is a ninja party, if you can't tell. Those are cups, and they're, they're drinking. <laughs> all right, so the class. That's it with the tips. Uh, that was really all that I could think of that I did differently than any other professor. Um, so the class, the class is official title is Penetration Testing and Vulnerability Analysis. It wasn't just pen testing. Um, I took over the class in about July 2008. It was sometime in the middle of the summer when I was talking to my professor about it. And we decided to run the class on campus uh, at night, as the previous advice uh, suggested. We had about 22 registered students, uh, plus or minus one. And they were mostly fourth year CS and CE uh, undergrads, and we had a handful of graduate students. Most of them had little to no experience in InfoSec. Uh, everybody was pretty much unfamiliar with every topic we brought up. And I also invited eight other students to attend the class. Now, why would I do that? These, these eight guys, they showed up, they actually did work, and I actually graded it. <laughs> and it was more work for me, and nobody's getting paid for that. Um, the reason I did that is because these eight students were so interested in the topic, that they approached me and they showed up to every class and they did all the work. And that's extremely encouraging to the rest of the students there. They helped me on the mailing list. Uh, they asked questions during class. It was an enriching experience for everybody else to have them there. So, you know, don't turn anybody away. It's not about money or credits. It's, it's all about learning. So invite everybody you want. <laughs> okay. So, once I got control of the class, I sat down with these uh, instructors, and we decided that 
these were the six or seven skills that we thought were necessary to be a uh, to to be a good pen tester, to be a good vulnerability analyzer. Um, now you'll notice these are these are a little bit of a step above what most certifications will give you. Um, if you're taking, well, I won't name any certifications, but you can pick a few. <laughs> um, these teach you uh, the basic skills that I think are necessary in order to be good in the, in information security. It, we're not teaching them things to memorize. We're not teaching them command switches or how to use tools. We're teaching them how to build tools and how to understand how tools work. So we were at a level above uh, what I think most people offer. Okay, so each professor took one skill. Dean took kind of two. <laughs> um, and we taught uh, that section for two weeks. So one guy would come in, he would teach two classes, and each class had a homework associated with it, and the assignments, all the homeworks, they followed the previous advice. So we had people reversing real malware, we had people fuzzing real software, we had people writing interpreter scripts. Um, there were a variety of teaching methods used. Uh, some people came in with labs, some people uh, didn't come in with slides at all, they just said, hey, who's got a marker, <laughs> and started writing on the board. Um, and most of us prepared slides. All those different methods worked. No one is better than the other. If you're gonna do a course like this, you don't have to have every single time you meet be a lab, and you don't have to have slides for every lecture. Um, really, the delivery and the content was more important than the method of how we were presenting it to them. Uh, and then, as I said before, live demos blew students away. This goes back to the one minute of excitement. Students became more engaged with the class and with us. If we could show them in the first minute uh, something they were going to learn today that was useful, practical, and exciting. Um, yeah, so you know, you, you show them a VNC inject payload, the first time they've ever seen that, and their jaws drop to the floor and you've got them for the rest of the two hours. And you can do that with every topic. Um, fuzzing is easy to do, and after they learn exploitation it's easy to do. Uh, reverse engineering, you know, you patch software. Uh, just a little bit of creativity goes very far. Okay, so here's, here's my demo. So I said the demos are really important. So I'll show you what the class actually looks like. Um, this was Dean DeBeer coming in and speaking about uh, client-side attacks and post-exploitation. And I know you guys can't hear anything, but, you know, very simple. We had a lab and we had a projector. Projector is very important. Um, we actually have a cool setup where you can see in the front where what we're projecting on the screen shows up at every student's desk. Um, and that was very useful because a lot of the smaller details like, um, you know, immunity debugger, uh, like what registers you're manipulating will show up uh, at full size for who's ever watching. So this is our class and I'm going to be releasing a lot of these videos. They're two hours a piece. I have uh, 12 of them and they cover the entire course. So by the end of the week, I promise, I'll get, I'll get most of these to you. Okay, so what did I do? So besides, you know, the one source code analysis section that I did, um, I made sure the class flowed from week to week, which is very important. Um, you know, we talked about six or seven different skills, and some of them, uh, it's very easy to view them in isolation, and we didn't want that. We wanted to have one cohesive course, so I tried to provide that. Um, you know, I discussed ethics and disclosure as I went over. I provided extra help, any of the students that needed um, help with an assignment or they didn't understand part of the lecture, I could meet them midweek because I was actually going to school there and I would show up every day and I had classes with a lot of them, which is kind of odd. Um, and I made solution guides, so as the homework was due, I would make my own solution, which was a valuable experience for me, I'd say, <laughs> and uh, give them out to all the students. Um, I also moderated the mailing list, so if anybody uh, posted a question and didn't get an answer, you know, I would pick up that, that thread and. Uh, answer them. Um, and then I introduced each topic a week beforehand, which was very valuable. All right, so this, this helped, I helped fully immerse the students in the material. Okay. So some people thought I should take this slide out. This is boring, this is not useful, but I, I feel like this is very important. Um, the way you grade the class kind of directs uh, what students are gonna do to, to pass it. And 
a lot of professors don't put a priority on homework and they they only give it you know 20 percent 10 percent whatever but in this class where you're learning a new skill every week and the course switches gears so fast that if you don't do the homework you're not only going to fall behind but you're not going to get much out of it so i graded that very highly to make sure that all the students did it uh, the midterm i felt was primarily for me to make sure that the students were uh, learning the material and they were um, understanding what was going on and it was sort of less for them. I really, I really don't like tests, it's just my preference. Um, so when I had to make one, I made sort of this choose your own adventure test. Um, some of the topics we went over like web hacking and reverse engineering are direct opposites of each other and people who are good at one aren't going to be good at the other one uh, most of the time um, or at least like both of them. So when I gave them the midterm, I let them choose various questions that they wanted to answer, you know, up to a point, so that uh, if there was one particular skill they really weren't interested in, they didn't have to answer those questions. Um, and I'll releasing that too, so you can see what I mean. Uh, I felt that communication was essential, so I gave 15% to class participation, and I made them all do a final project instead of a test. And the final project was very open-ended. They could choose what they wanted to, what they wanted to do. Um, I just had to approve it. And I felt like that was a much better representation of their retention of the material than uh, anything else. Because seeing them present it and being able to ask questions um, was very easy for me to understand whether they knew what they were talking about. Uh, I also offered extra credit for anything outside um, that they did that was related to the course. So things like capture the flag contests. If they participated in one, I bumped up their grade. And that's a good way to get them more involved in the community and the type of work that we're doing in the class. And lots of students took me up on that offer and were very happy for it because they had a lot of fun doing the CTF. Um, so also my preference, uh, I don't really care about lateness. I didn't tell them that. <laughs> uh, I'm sure all of them will know next semester if I end up teaching the class because they'll see this video. But um, I want them to understand the material more than I, than I want them to hand in the assignments on time. And if they get something late to me, uh, but they can prove that they knew what was going on, then, you know, fine, that's, that's good. So I didn't really take off points for that. <clears throat> okay, so how did I do the final project? So going into the final project, I had three goals. Uh, I wanted to allow students to explore their interests. So as I said before, some people are going to be way more interested in low-level programming and not very interested at, you know, layer seven type stuff. So if they wanted to do uh, a project on reverse engineering, I wanted to let them. Um, no matter what they chose, I wanted them to display mastery of at least one skill we taught them. So this is important. I needed to understand that they picked up what we taught them in the course. And I wanted them to document their experience for others. So no matter what they did, even if they wrote code or you know, they did some vulnerability analysis, I wanted them to write a document that they could give to either another student or post online or give to me uh, that would walk through somebody who doesn't have a lot of experience in this topic what they did so that um, I could give it to another student who hasn't taken the course yet and they can immediately understand some of the topics that we went over. I feel like that's very valuable sort of as a, as a like continuing long-term goal uh, if you wanna you know, get a population of people that understand this. Um, we graded it via committee, so you know, giving a presentation like this can be very subjective, so we had multiple people show up and we averaged our grades together. And this was one part of the course that I felt like we could have done better. Uh, we should have introduced it near the start. We introduced this after the midterm and having people come up with projects uh, at like the seven week point and then only having about you know three to four weeks max to implement their ideas is tough. Um, we should have told them at the beginning, first week, that this is what we expect, um, this is what you have to choose from, like these are some sample projects you can work on, start thinking about it now and give me a proposal you know, before the midterm. Uh, one other problem that we had was that I let people do group projects. Um, I didn't think that this was a good idea afterwards. Um, with any group project, you always end up getting somebody who's sort of mooching off everybody else. And it's hard to tell whether uh, everybody in that group understood everything as well as the other, the other members. So 
for future courses, there will always be a single project at the end. Okay, so there's the tiny URL. Uh, at 404 is right now, so nobody go to it. I'll fix it up during lunch. But um, I'm going to make as many of the course videos, the assignments, the tests, uh, and some of the student work available. Uh, what's up? Oh, sorry. It's tinyurl.com slash source dash ninjas. Okay. <laughs> no problem. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so all of you will be able to download some of the material that we use to teach our students and, uh, you know, manipulate it or not and use it for your own courses. Okay, so at this point I just want to say thank you to everybody that was involved in teaching with me. Uh, Stephen Ridley, Dino, is in the back over here now and he's going to be speaking next, so stay for his talk. Uh, Mike Zuzman, Dean DeBeer, Eric Cabetas, and uh, Justin, Dan, Mike, and Stephen for helping me with the presentation. Uh, Chris Ang, where is he, for convincing me to talk, and my professor uh, Memon for letting me take over the class. So at this point, I'll ask, are there any questions? Oh, oh boy. All right. Uh, Adam. Uh, so this, this is very interesting to me because I spend a lot of time working with people who don't necessarily come in knowing a lot about security and training them up. And I'm wondering what you think would happen if you have, instead of self-selected students who are interested in the topic, if you made this a mandatory course, how would that go? Ooh, uh, yeah, I, I think part of the reason of the success of the course was because it's an elective and everybody that was there, that was there chose to be there and wanted to be there. Um, I mean, there's lots of, you know, sort of tricks, some social engineering, if you may, uh, that you can use to convince people to be more attentive and be more interested. And some of it I went over, like, you know, the one minute of excitement rule and um, making sure that you have live demos and engaging speakers. But uh, I, I, would, I would always be wary of any sort of mandatory course like that. It may not turn out the same. I, I've never done a course like that, so I can't say. But, you know, try to follow the tips as best as I can, and hopefully it'll turn out for the best. <laughs> What's up? So that's something we're looking into. Um, we want to keep teach. Uh, we want to keep this course as it is because um, you know pen testing is a very uh, it's a it's a huge topic and it's one that I think deserves its own course. Um, but for the rest of the university as a whole, some things that we're looking into are having members of our lab uh, create training material for like an operating systems class about um, compiler and operating system memory corruption protections. Uh, and then giving that material, offering it to um, the professor that teaches that course, or making a short module about fuzzing or source code analysis or static analysis tools and giving it to a software development class. Um, I think those are all definitely valuable activities, but uh, not related to you know what I did. So I, I think you should do that <laughs> if you're thinking about doing it. Uh, and if you want to talk to me about you know how, talk to me afterwards, and I'll give you my ideas. That, um, that kid from Vancouver, notwithstanding, uh, when it came time to test their efforts, yeah. to test their projects, did you involve any outside organizations, companies in the local area, or did you just test them internally? Uh, no, we just tested them internally. We had them uh, create their projects and create a presentation for us and show up at a predetermined time and uh, you know give us demos just like we gave them. Um, and the people that were that were watching those presentations were all extremely technical people that were, you know, could understand what they were speaking about. We didn't just grab random people out of the hallway. <laughs> uh, and I was there for all of them too. So. Do you have any plans to maybe involve some outside organizations? Because I'd imagine if they were gonna, if they knew their 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 tests were gonna be used on, on real companies, that would probably get pretty fired up. Yeah, that's something that we could look into. I mean, like I said, you know, making everything practical is a great way to get students more engaged in the work and yeah, sure. I mean, talk to me afterwards. Might, might work. Hey. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, well, um, making sure that you keep everything practical and related to current events and things they can actually use uh, is really important. Um, making sure that they're excited and showing them demos. And uh, I mean, if you're engaged in your community, maybe you can find some people uh, at a city sec meeting to bring in as a you know a guest lecture, and it might be a little bit more you know special than every other course, every other uh, time that you've met before. Um, and that's something that you can sort of advertise around the school, and people might show up to. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, I really don't know what to say. <laughs> uh, just keep trying to convince your university to make that an official course. I've done the same thing before, like previous semesters. I taught a little thing on buffer overflows once, and you know I had the same kind of problems. So I, I, I know where you're coming from. <laughs> Uh, we, we didn't really have that. Um, we didn't really uh, feel like it was too important. Um, it was a little bit more effort to create something like that. So more of what we did was we made applications that we could distribute to the students. So uh, an executable they could download from someplace and run on their own computer rather than having a centralized server environment that had all sorts of things they could break into. Uh, and that was, that was a, a conscious decision. Um, it lessened our uh, the amount of work we had to put into this, because this was a lot of work. Um, so probably the biggest thing we distributed was a, was a virtual machine image, but that's, that's as far as it went. Uh, the, the web hacking one is the, the obvious difference, and I, I think if we did this in the, in the future, uh, we would put up sort of a vulnerable web application just as that one assignment, and that's not too much effort. You can actually deploy that in a virtual machine as well. So, yep. Yeah, I, I, I've done. I've gone through WebGoat before, and I'm not a huge fan, <laughs> uh, which is why I put more of a preference on developing something myself rather than using what's out there because I don't feel like there's too much good for that. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? Oh. Kind of building off what you said, I know at our university there's kind of this stigma that yeah. you can't teach anything offensive. We don't want to be known as a hacker school. Did you have any experiences with that? Maybe Yeah, so, I mean, like I said, our program was kind of already started. I didn't have to deal with it so much. Um, if, like, like I said, speaking to them on terms of certifications and getting grant money and getting students to come to the university is good. If you want to sort of approach the topic more directly, you could say that if you're teaching defense, you're not going to know how well you're doing unless you have somebody who's trying to break it. Uh, the obvious justification for, for pen testing in general. Um, I feel like people would be more dismissive of that latter argument than the former one, <laughs> simply because dollars are much easier to look at and a lot more, uh, you know, like gimme gimme. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that's all I can really say. I don't know what to tell you. I'll help if I can. <laughs> I mean, you could take them and you could show them this course and you could show them this presentation. Maybe that'll convince them. Um, but that's the best I could do. Okay. Uh, Grade-wise, I think we had an average of about a B plus. Um, I only gave out, I, I gave out like a less than five Cs, I'll say. We'll just do this kind of. Um, and most of the class, I think, got A's. Uh, I was extremely happy with the work that most of the students handed in, and I could give them nothing other than an A. <laughs> they would be very upset if they got something less. Yeah. Okay. Is that it? Cool.